Hi, I'm John, and welcome back to another intermediate JavaScript tutorial. In this episode, we'll be talking about the stack, the heap, and cover some important things to keep in mind when you're working with JavaScript functions synchronously. Let's get to it. So as always, you can get all the material that's covered in this video by going to my GitHub. I'll put a link in the description. In this episode specifically, we'll be covering the call stack, which is number four. So when we open up the file, we see a visual representation of the stack and the heap. We'll cover it down below in more detail. But essentially, the heap is where variables are stored, whereas the stack handles the order in which things happen. On top, you see this str variable set to hello, which is a string. Then you have an object, which is referencing an object, and that object contains a key, int, which is set to a number. Below that, since functions are objects, you see func is referencing this function, which takes value, and it's going to take object.int and set it to whatever value is passed. Over on the call stack, you see this main function and on top of it, func7. So let's dive in now and learn a little bit more about the heap and the stack and make sense of it all. Essentially, the heap is a free store or heap of memory. Variables are allocated on the heap, both literals and references, and the heap is managed by the JS engine. That just kind of brings up an important point which is the fact that everything that I'm gonna go over today is conceptually how things work, but when it comes to optimizations under the hood, different browsers are gonna treat things differently. That said, the order in which things are done should be the same across all browsers. In the end, the heap is basically responsible for housing the data. And that takes us to the stack. The stack is a first in last out or philo data structure which is composed of frames of commands. Those commands are accessing data on the heap, and it all starts by running the main function, which contains the global scope. Hi guys, so I was just quickly editing the video, and I realized I didn't properly clarify that the main function isn't something that you'll ever see. It's handled by the browser, and it essentially includes all of the JavaScript code that's included, and that's what the main function is. So, like I said, it's nothing you'll ever see. You can think of main as just the JavaScript code that starts running in the global scope. And past that, you don't really have to worry about it. All right, back to other. Now, if we scroll back up to this picture, you see this main function is the first frame. On top of it, you have another frame, which is func. Too many frames is going to result in a stack overflow. And we'll look at an example of that later. Once you get some descriptions of the stack and the heap, I think the only way to fully understand them is just by looking at examples and playing around with it a bit. So let's do that. We will start by looking at these functions one, two, and three. The core functionality of function one is to log one and then call two and then log one again. If we want extra info, we can pass that as just a true value and it'll print off some other things, letting us know when the function is added to the stack or popped off the stack. And that same pattern follows for two and three. Two is gonna log two, run three, then log two again. Three just console logs off that three. So what are we gonna see? Well, if we run one here, we're gonna see one gets called, then two, then three, and then we go back and finish two and finish one. And if we run it with this true value, we get more information about how that makes sense in the context of the stack. Essentially, we're adding one to the stack, calling one, then adding two to the stack, which means two's going on top of one. Then again, three goes on top of two. At that point, if we look up at our picture here, we would essentially have main on the bottom, then one, and then two, and then three. And the stack is always working from a top down which is why that term first in last out is used because main is the very first frame on the stack, but it's gonna be the last to be popped off of the stack. Now I wrote another example of this called show recursively, which does something similar, but it allows you to demonstrate that over more calls. Now what we're doing here is we're saying if X is greater than zero, then call show recursively, but passing it one less than X. Otherwise log that we have reached zero and return back. If you haven't returned 
zero, then you're not gonna obviously hit this return statement, which means you're gonna say current x start of the function, current x end of the function. So if we run show recursively five, we're taking five, we're logging that out, and then we're passing four. And when that function starts, it's logging four, then you go to the three and then the two and then the one. And in this instance, what you would see is you'd have the main at the bottom followed by show recursively stacked on top of itself, first passing in five, then four, then three, then two, then one, and then zero. So even though it's the same function, that's just calling itself, it's a new frame. So what you would see if you wanted to visualize this on the stack is you've got this main frame at the bottom. One would already have been popped off and then we're running show recursively. So first you'd get a frame for show recursively five and then four and then three and then two, one and zero. And each time you call it, even though it's the same function is going to be a new frame. And that's important to keep in mind because recursive functions are probably one of the most common ways that people end up causing stack overflows. So how does this look when it comes to debugging? Well, I've created three more functions that are gonna help visualize that. We've got watch the stack trace, it wasn't me, and then error time. So watch the stack trace is gonna be placed as a frame on the stack, and then on top of it, we'll see it wasn't me. Finally, that's going to call error time, which is gonna throw a new error, and we'll see that error logged out on the console. So first, let's clear this off and run watch the stack trace. Now, as expected, it threw the error, that shit broken. But below that, this is what it's referring to as the stack trace. It's going backwards down the stack. And so when it comes to debugging your code, it's gonna be an important tool for tracking problems. So in our case, we see error time. If we click on that, we can see exactly where in our code everything broke. Now, this episode isn't gonna be about debugging tools in Chrome. We'll save that for the future, but this does give you a visual of the stack and the order in which things are run. We see error time, which was called by it wasn't me, which is called by watch the stack trace. Now, obviously the stack doesn't have unlimited resources. And so if you call too many frames onto the stack, eventually it's gonna freak out at you. And we can simulate that by this function overflow where we're just returning and calling overflow again. So when we call overflow, it's gonna add a stack, then call overflow and add another stack on top, which goes on top, on top, on top, till eventually the stack can't take it anymore. And so if we run that, uncaught, range error, maximum call stack size exceeded. And that's where we see overflow, 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 overflow. And if we click on that, you can see that Google Chrome basically said after 120 some calls, nope, and cut it off. Now, just as a little visual, if you go to Stack Overflow, that might help their logo make a little more sense. If we zoom in here, you can see you've got the end of the stack and all of these frames are shooting off. It's too much information. I just think it's a cool visual and a good reminder of how things are all working. So understanding the stack and the heap are very important parts to knowing the order in which things are gonna call, which is important when you're writing your own code. Now keep in mind, this is specifically for synchronous JavaScript, as in things that happen one after another. When it comes to events, things like set timeout, that's gonna be handled by the event loop. And that's what we'll cover in the next video. So I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope you got some interesting information out of it. If you did, feel free to leave a like, subscribe, and leave a comment, which would help grow the channel. All right, see you next time. <laughs>